got Dr. Pooley uh, presenting on DMEC. Okay. So I'm, I'm just going to go over some of the basics of DMEC and how endothelial keratoplasty evolved into DMEC. And we'll show a little bit of the surgical technique. I have some videos here. So DSEC, which was, was first performed in the U.S. in 2003, and it, the automated form of DSEC involves using a microkeratome cut posterior stromal tissue and decimase membrane. And usually that tissue is about, it's, with ultra-thin DSEC, it's less than 100 sometimes, but it's usually between 100 and 140 microns of tissue thickness. DMEC was done in Germany in 2006 for the first time, and that just involves in inserting the stripped decimase membrane for uh, endothelial failure. So the, there are some advantages that a lot of things are being published, and I have some, a couple recent studies I'll show you too, but um, some of the advantages potentially to DMEC <coughs> over DSEC are very rapid visual recovery, Sometimes it's a little bit more predictable, and the replacement, the replacement of the tissue, some people think that that's because it's anatomic replacement. Um, there is less shift in refraction, less hyperopic shift since the tissue's thin, um, and there's the potential for better post-operative visual acuity and, and likely less higher order aberration since there is no stromal interface. And similar to DSEC, and some studies show potentially even less, re less rejection than with DSEC, but substantially better than penetrating keratoplasty. So this is a study that came out this month sh um, showing s the visual potential after DMEC. This, this was done by an experienced DSEC surgeon who'd done over 200 transplants, and he compared his last 100 DSECs to his first 100 DMEC surgeries. And the best spectacle corrected visual acuity was near 2020 with the DMEC and around 2030 with the DSEC, which is pretty consistent which, with what's been shown in other studies as well. Um, the, one of the more impressive differences is over 50% of those DMEC patients were 2020 or better. And com that, that's sometimes a little harder ach to achieve with DSEC, and a lot of people think it's that stromal interface that's limiting the visual potential with the DSEC, DSEC um, graphs in this study were 13% where 2020 or better. Um, one thing people worry about with DMEC is the level of endothelial cell loss, which is probably a little bit more than DSEC. And in this study, he, this person did a pretty good job because 31% is, is a pretty reasonable rate of endothelial cell loss um, initially after the surgery in the first month compared to 20% for the DSEC. So this was, uh, this was another study on long-term outcomes after DMEC, and this, this involved 310 patients, and they had a 95% five-year graft survival. We don't have a lot of data beyond five years at this point, just since it's such a new surgery, but um, they also showed 42% endothelial cell loss at one month, and that stayed really stable over the first five years, and they only had 44% endothelial cell loss. Raising up to. I'm really happy it wasn't just the old guy who didn't run the computer. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so, uh, this also came out this month from, um, from Mellis in Germany, who did the first DMEC in 2006, and he, he followed this patient over the last 10 years, and he showed that this particular DMEC, which is very likely representative of the experience people are going to be having with DMEC. They had a 70% decrease in endothelial cell count over 10 years, which is similar to what's been published for DSEC. And this patient had better than 2020 visual acuity on most of their visits. They were usually between 2025 and 2017. So this shows the trend of transitioning to DMEC. And just, just for historical interest, here, the, in 2005, only 4.5% of transplants in the U.S. were endothelial keratoplasty. Um, so there's been a really rapid rise. And this kind of shows 
you know, there now there are, in 2015 there are more endothelial keratoplasties being done than penetrating, um, and you can see just over the last several years how quickly DMEC is taking taking over. Okay, here we go again. So I have just some videos on the technique. So this is showing after we, we use a 3.2 millimeter temporal incision, um, and this is after a stripping of the decimase membrane. So you have to make an inferior peripheral iridotomy. We, we've been doing it with a vitrector. This is in a fake patient. Um, that's because we inject gas at the end of the surgery that stays there for a while. We use 20% SF6. Um, and this, these are a couple, a couple of short videos of the tissue prep. So, and usually we stain the, we stain the tissue before we, we lift it up. So this is pre-stripped tissue that, and that's one of the big things that's allowed this surgery to be adopted is that eye banks now are pre-stripping the tissue. So they, they kind of lift it up most of the way and then lay it back down on the bed. Um, so then here we're staining. And so this is after the initial stain. So you, it's a little bit hard to see. Can we turn these, these lights in the front off? It might be a little bit easier to see. So this is after we cut the tissue, and then we remove the rim of decimase around the central punch. And so then we're just lifting the tissue up here. And this one turns into a pretty tight scroll. And they always scroll with the endothelial side out. And then we restain it so it has a deep blue stain so you can see it in the anterior chamber after it's injected. You'll be able to see the scroll in a second here. You have to be, you have to be really careful when you're removing the tripan blue, because that that graft is just floating around, and there are there are definitely cases where people have gotten it stuck to the wex cell with that endothelial not endothelial side out. That's not. Not ideal, obviously. Yeah, so there you can there you can see the graft over there in the corner. It's kind of close to the weck, and we're just removing the rest of the fluid from the notch there. And so then we use a, um, so there are different kinds of injectors. Some people use plastic injectors, but we've been using a modified glass Jones tube. So then we draw that up into the Jones tube. You have to be really careful not to get air bubbles in there. And this is injecting the graft. So you, it's important to maintain a really shallow chamber when you're doing this so the graft stays in there. And there are also a number of people who've reported the graft shooting right back out when they remove the injector, right out through that temporal incision. Um, and so probably the most challenging part of DMEC surgery is getting that graft to unscroll, which every, every tissue acts differently, but um, what most people are doing is this tapping technique that uses fluid waves, and you have to constantly shallow the anterior chamber to help with unscrolling. And these are the tissue that we're using is pre-stamped with a, an S stamp that allows you to tell if it's if it's endothelial so, side in the correct orientation. You kind of have to keep the graft centered over your desmetorexis at the same time. This one unscrolls fairly easily. Sometimes it's a lot more challenging than this. But it, it's a little bit difficult to see. That's 
the S stamp is in the wrong orientation in this case. And so we had to flip the graft around so you can use a, a fluid burst to kind of flip the graft, which I did there. And then tap it back out into the correct orientation. It's a little difficult to see, but the S-stamp's now in the correct orientation there. And so then after that, we inject 20% SF6 underneath it, the graft to push it up against the stroma. And usually that dissolves over seven days or so, or it's five to seven days. Um, so a few of the challenges, stripping the tissue is definitely one of the early limiting factors and that that's a lot easier now that eye banks are doing pre-strip tissue because that was a big risk if you're trying to strip that that decimase membrane in the OR right before your case that that it can tear pretty easily um, there's less predictability just because every tissue behaves really differently with DMEC and some of these might take 40 minutes to get them to unscroll or be really difficult. Every anterior chamber is different. Some are really hard to shallow enough to unscroll the graft. Uh, the rebubbling rate is higher with DMEC than DSEC and the, that, those rates are sometimes pretty high and studies report between one and a half and 50% in some studies for early experience. And primary graft failure rate is probably also higher, especially with the, the initial experience. So this is actually the patient that was in the videos. So she had a, a detachment, and if it's over 30%, then usually it needs rebubbling. Um, and so the top OCT, anterior segment OCT, here you can see that, that detachment there that's probably 45 or 50%. So that was seven days after. Then we did rebubbling on this day, and this is her. This is her graft a few days later. It was nicely attached, and we saw her for post-op month one uh, a couple weeks ago. She was she was 2025 20, uncorrected with her suture still in, so she may end up close to 2020 20, uncorrected. So just a few things that are important in the early stages with DMAC shallowing. Having a patient that you can shallow the anterior chamber that does that has a small pupil, using retrobulbar anesthesia or general anesthesia for the early cases. This is easier in Fuchs dystrophy because it's easier to strip the tissue, and if you have stromal tags, it can be really difficult to get these to attach well. Um, and then picking donor tissue is also important. The pre-step pre-strip tissue from the eye bank is very beneficial. Um, and some people only use donors between specific ages because the they think the tissue behaves better. And some people only use 60 to 65 year old tissue or most people don't like tissue that's younger than 55 year, years old. Um, and most people like to have an endothelial cell count that's 3,000 or higher. So it's usually not a great option in patients that are post vitrectomy because you can't shallow the chamber very easily. If they have glaucoma filters or tubes, it can be done. And some people are doing DMEC in these patients, but there are obviously are more risks to doing that kind of surgery. ACIOL is a problem since you're using that shallow chamber and the endothelium is rubbing all over the ACIOL. Um, aphakia is a problem since that tissue can go right behind the pupil easily. Um, and it's not good if they live at really high altitude. And we always ask patients about this if they're going to be traveling up at 10,000 feet or something like that with that SF6 gas. Okay. Comment? This is really yeah. cool stuff. Um, you know, I really love the fact that they're getting thinner and thinner and thinner and really just doing now decimated membrane and endothelial cells. Um, Garrett Mellis would be very perturbed if you call him a German as he's Dutch. Oh, sorry about that, yeah. He's kind of akin to calling a Utah U grad someone from Germany. Yeah, sorry. He, I, think, I think he practices in Germany partially. The second thing is, is yeah. there's an issue with the gas and hydrophilic acrylic So I'll let Liliana comment on that. Yeah, so just as a reminder, if you have these procedures done in a certain way, to reinject a lot of gas or air to reattach flaps, 
the transport multiplication is actually 10%. So you have to keep this in mind, maybe, foundation. And if you plan this ahead with cathar surgery, do not put the IVP in the What do they usually rebubble with? I think most people use air because they're doing it in the clinic, but some people will probably use SF6. Some people use air primarily, though, and that's an option, too, for people that are going to be at high altitude. So if you do the OCG every time at seven days, or what's kind of... No, we, we've mostly been doing it if, there's, if they're edematous or we're concerned about a problem. It's really hard to see the tissue. So you, without the anterior segment OCT, it's really hard to tell if it's detached or anything. With a DSEC, you can often tell, but it, with DMEC tissue, it's so thin, you can barely see the tissue, and usually they still have a little bit of edema. But they recover very quickly after this. And we've had some combined FACO DMECs that we've done now, and, and some of those patients are, they're 2020 uncorrected at mo one month after surgery. So it, it, the results in the visual recovery are very impressive. Two, two questions. Why not do a YAG PI pre-op? And second question, has the decimate stripping with no graft gone away entirely, that, that case series and idea? Uh, the, the just primary desmetorexis. Mm -hmm. So that has not gone away, but I think the problem is then you're leaving the patient at Demetis for for months and probably most people are not going to be happy with that. You can do, some people do YAG PIs before, but I think we like the Vitrector PI just because it's big and open and you don't want them to get a big pressure spike. And do you feel like in the developing world, does metarexis without graft is a reasonable <laughs> option? For people yeah, that other yeah, potentially, and in other countries, um, in other countries, in Europe especially, they're, you, they're doing quarter DMEC grafts where they do a desmetorexis and they'll cut, the, they'll cut a single piece of tissue into four segments or two segments and just put that in the middle and then let the rest fill in with endothelial cells. But the, the concern I have about that though is, I mean, you see that there's a pretty substantial rate of endothelial cell loss and it can even, in some studies, they even report problems with when there isn't a big graft put in there that they think that it's going to fail earlier because there aren't enough endothelial cells left. So that would be my concern with doing these quarter grafts is that they're going to wear out a lot sooner, which may be okay for some patients, but. There, there's one patient at Moran that had the desmetorexis. It, it took like four or six months for his central edema to go away after the procedure was done, he ended up about 20-30. So, and I, I think they did, they did uh, end up in the field of cell counts and it did decrease kind of paracentrally as, as his edema result. Are there, are there certain indications for that? I mean, is, is it the sort of thing where uh, PBK does better uh, than boots or, I mean, or for just primary desmetorexis? Well, probably, I mean, Fuchs would be probably the easiest since the, tish, the decimase comes off so easily, I would think, but. Um, Catherine Colby, who's like, she was yeah, at she's, here, now she's at the University of Chicago. She's, she's probably done the most in the country. We went to a meeting with her, and she, they, they have not seen any success in PPK, just because they think that we toasted all the other field right. cells. So they're mainly doing it for Fuchs, and tons of discussion with the patients that you're going to be, have really blurry vision for months and months and months. I think most people are, because these patients are often, they're 2040, some people are doing 2030 patients with DMEC now since the visual results are so good. I, I think, I've heard Mark Terry say he'll even consider doing like 2025 patients because they're, even if their acuity's not, not that bad, I think their quality of vision is, is pretty bad with the light scatter from the, the Goutte, but but I would think that somebody who's 2025 20, is not going to be very happy with that. Even 2040 or 2050, they're not going to be very happy with that.